I know, I see Dan, Hi. Uh, who is the amazing creator of This Is Us, and Lisa Genova, who wrote Still Alice, and TJ Oshi, who uh, was is a caregiver himself uh, for his father, who is passed away, and who is an incredible speaker uh, and sharing his story. And Lydia uh, Story, who works with uh, Caring Cross Generations, who does incredible work talking about uh, caregiver advocacy, and of course, Pamela Adlon from Better Things, uh, an amazing show which uh, accurately uh, portrays people living with dementia. And I feel like all of you do such an amazing job to uh, shed a really honest and accurate portrayal of dementia and, and, and sharing the story of dementia. Um, so I'm so excited to, to have this discussion. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Uh, who uh, is gonna gonna guide us through? Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, all right, so we are gonna start with Pamela. Um, so, Pamela, can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration to include a character with dementia in your storyline? And did that feel in any way like a risky choice? Well, um, so the character of Phil. Uh, uh, I play Sam on my show and my mother is Phil Celia Emery. Um, I decided to not put a label on what was happening with her in terms of her cognitive abilities um, and just would have these moments. And so there was one episode where um, she basically like Munchausen's herself by you know, going into a, a, a hole and breaking her own foot so she could get attention, you know, from people and to get out of a situation where she actually stole something and her behavior became completely erratic. And, uh, you know, uh, then, you know, she could be fine. And then I decided to not have her go down completely mm -hmm. um, because some people, you don't know when something is going on with them and it could seem like they're having a really bad moment and uh, maybe they need to be committed and then they're fine. Um, Diedrich Bader, who plays Rich in my show, um, the story that Rebecca Metz says to Sam when they're at a bar about how um, her father was uh, uh, really tough on her and semi-abusive. And then it turned around and she was taking care of him and literally cleaning himself after he goes to the bath, cleaning him after he goes to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And the irony of somebody who lorded over you and then you become their caregiver is really Diedrich's story, mm -hmm. um, which is heartbreaking. And then Phil uh, gets connected with a, a man um, played by Harrison Page, whose wife has Alzheimer's and um, and she starts seeing him and having a relationship with him. And my character judges her for that. And um, she said, you know, you don't know what life is like and how complicated it is. Mm -hmm. and, it's not about being married. It's sometimes a matter of how married are you and where are you in, in the world? And to, you know, some people who have a partner who is alive with Alzheimer's um, uh, can have comfort with somebody else. And it's not necessarily uh, betraying the person that you were with for so many years. So that was a lot of different things no so it's a it's a really nuanced human condition that millions of people are living with and it doesn't just look one way right so i think that that this is a way of showing what can go on and um it's i'm reminded of um barry peterson's story with um his wife jan he wrote a book called jan's story and he was married and she was in late stages of alzheimer's and he found love and comfort with someone else and how to navigate that um Dan, similar question to you. So you've got your show, This Is Us, and you have a character with Alzheimer's. 
what was the inspiration to in, include that? And again, was there any pushback or did you feel there were any obstacles or risks to having Alzheimer's in a mainstream show? Yeah, I mean, we had a, I had always in the back of my mind thought that that's where the story was going to go. The show, you know, we didn't get there for a while. It wasn't until about the fourth season of the show. And so it was something that wasn't really mapped out heavily from the beginning. And it, it wasn't a disease I had a lot of personal experience with. And so, um, but the show was always about, you know, losing, losing parents. And then it was about memory and time and it was about family. And so my lay person's understanding of everything, it, that was where I thought we were going. As we got there, there was definitely like that moment when we stepped back as writers and said, you know, this is, it's a lot to take on. We want to be responsible and do it the right way. We also want to monitor, you know, um, how to do this properly and and tell our our version of a story that is going to be for a family scary and and sad, um, but be able to live inside of families and the the caretaker experience, the familial experience, the the experience of the family member who's not nearby, um, and and be able to kind of attack it from all ends. It's something we're doing most heavily right now. I mean, I'm coming onto this Zoom call fresh from coming off of a an entire episode about the life of, of the caretaker over, over time. Um, and so as we've gone further, I felt both uh, ill-equipped at the beginning because it, it wasn't something I had personal experience with and I wanted to get it right. And we've been lucky to have um, really incredible people, you know, working with us and helping us and sharing their stories, which are all so unique and individual um, that we're trying to craft something that feels real to people, but also specific to our, our characters but yeah it's been an undertaking it's one that as we move forward i'm i'm, really, I'm proud of hopefully and hopefully we'll be well met by the people who have ex experienced uh, yeah well we honestly thank you for for taking it on with such a sense of responsibility um and authenticity and telling the truth under your imagined circumstances because it really does matter for for the people who live with it to feel like their journey is being portrayed accurately and with respect and dignity. And then it's an opportunity for people who don't know Alzheimer's yet, like, you know, like you before this experience to be educated in it as to the, the realities of this. Um, so thank you yeah. for taking well, we've learned, job so we've learned a lot for sure. Um, as we've been going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, TJ. Can you tell us a little bit about your dad and your experience um, in learning about his diagnosis of Alzheimer's and then um, your journey with him? Yeah, um, so I am uh, a hockey player for the Washington Capitals and in my, uh, in my 14th season in the NHL. Um, my dad was diagnosed, um, I was probably about four or five years into the league uh, when he was 48 years old, he had um, um, familial Alzheimer's and, and had early onset at 48. That was when we noticed his memory starting to slip. And um, I, I told the, you know, my background in hockey because my dad grew up being my, my coach in all sports. Um, I was the, uh, you know, stinky little athlete kid that was running from basketball to hockey to football to golf, soccer, everything. And uh, my dad was my coach in basically everything. Um, and so I actually just called him coach. I never, I called him dad when I was really little, but as we grew up and I got to my, my high school years, he just became coach. And uh, yeah, so he, he got diagnosed early and um, with my schedule and, and uh, where I've, I play, I was in St. Louis when he was diagnosed and then got traded here to DC is my seventh year here. Um, and our family's from Seattle or just North of Seattle. So he was, uh, he took on uh, Alzheimer's for um, a bunch of years, about seven and a half years, and uh, um, passed last May. But he was he was taken care of by by the rest of our family for the most part, and I would be there to check in and call him every game day. And um, really, just I mean, I spend more time with with my, my dad and in his um, in his uh, you know fifty six years then um you know i think a lot of people get to spend with them just because of my journey to get to the nhl and uh yeah that was it my dad was a fantastic guy he was a storyteller he was uh 
a man that commanded the attention of the room. He was the Joker, and um, that was my story. We had a we had a great time. He had a a good fight with Alzheimer's, and um, kind of I'm guess kind of the way that that I got to um, be invited to this was we won the the Caps won the Stanley Cup back in 2018, and my dad uh, wasn't remembering. Uh, his memory had slipped quite a bit at that point, and uh, I flew him out for um, what was a potential clinching game in a game we won. And uh, his dream was always to win the Stanley Cup as a kid. And then once once he had uh, me and my brother and sister, his dream was for one of us to win it. And so it was cool to have him down on the ice. And uh, that was probably around the last time that he was, you know, really able to remember an event or something happening. So he, uh, he did until he, the day he died, remembered that uh, he held the Stanley Cup over his head. And that was uh, a very uh, good moment for us. Ah, oh, that's a very sweet, special moment. I'm so glad for all of you that he had that. And and I'll just interrupt, at, yeah. like, TJ, I feel like you're selling yourself short here on what an advocate you are and sharing your story and that, that in process is an amazing documentary. Uh, about TJ's story and it includes a, a lot about his journey as a caregiver. So I just have to, I can't let you not mention that. Oh, good. What's the name of the, do we have a name of that film yet? We do not have a name yet. Um, we kind of had something going, but it, it's probably going to change. So uh, it's been, it's been, we've been on it for a couple of years now. I'm certainly not comfortable in front of a camera um, or having cameras on me, um, but uh, our team's doing a great job and, um, trying to lean on Rogan's a little bit for uh, for, some, for some help to get it to the finish line, too. Well, it's a good story to share, so. I want to pitch titles later. <laughs> Please. Should we? I'm in. I'm in. T TJ, I think that, like, a lot of the general public's conception of this disease is that it happens to the elderly, or this is the disease of the dying elderly. So I'm imagining, you know, your dad at 48, I'm 51. Like, he doesn't look like the notion of what Alzheimer's is supposed to look like. Like, how did, how did the community react to your dad? Was it, wh was your family open about it? And did people em embrace it or did you have a hard time? I, I know that some people with the young onset, like have to actually convince people that, that this is what's going on. And um, it just can be really tough to have people wrap their minds around that someone so young could have this, this illness. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of people that have never um, had personal experiences with it don't really understand or aren't very well educated in, you know, how rapidly it, it can go. And so the first, you know, three or four years, he was actually, he was doing, I mean, really, really good. And when we told people right away, um, I feel like people thought this is just something that, you know, he has this gene and it's going to come on, you know, when he's in his late seventies, early eighties. Um, but it was a around, you know, people that maybe didn't see him on an everyday basis when they would see him, you know, maybe they only have family to visit every summer, they would see him every summer. And then all of a sudden four or five years in, it was really noticeable. And then I think it started hitting people that um, how serious, of a, of a disease it is and and um really how quickly it can it can kind of take someone's mind and memory from them yeah yep, thank you um let's move now to lydia um in your experience as someone doing culture change right because it's one of the reasons we're here yeah. is to sort of get the world to you know acknowledge and see and hear the culture of caregiving um what do you why do you think family caregiving is seen as a taboo subject or maybe it's you know seen as something not to go near or, or not very interesting to Hollywood? Um, well, I'm sure Dan and Pamela have pers a perspective on this too, but um, before joining Carrying Across, I actually spent over a decade um, as a creative executive in film and TV. So uh, I do feel like uh, both from my perspective and my background and also what we know from you know, the work that we're doing at Carrying Across, I think the, the biggest hurdle um, really is, you know, the thing that we're all kind of circling around, which is that caregiving is so often intrinsically linked to uh, subjects that are quite taboo in our culture, the subjects of illness, aging, death. Um, it feels sad. It feels 
like something um, people don't want to think about, right? And um, what's interesting, uh, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to come out the gate with and say, let's tell stories about caregiving. Um, so I think what's interesting, you know, being here with two incredible show creators today, it's like that's like the examples of what they are doing in their work, um, you know, kind of point to, uh, I think, a, a great way to, to bring caregiving more to the forefront by building worlds and characters and families on TV that, that you know, people are already invested in. You know, all of us come to TV and film for an escape, right? We don't want to be confronted necessarily, right? right off the bat with the harder things of life. But um, when you're already kind of in it with these characters and, and enjoying the time you're spending with them, it's a little easier to kind of seed in um, the difficult subject matter. And, you know, at Caring Across, we've done focus groups and research with, with caregivers um, and caregiving families around the country. And, you know, people tell us they do want to see, you know, what they're dealing with in life represented um, in, on screen and in stories, and um, it just has to be done in the right way, right? It, it, it want people crave something that's a little bit like digestible, lighthearted, um, not too heavy. Um, so if we can find the opportunities to to shed light on caregiving um, in a in a way that's relatable and grounded and real, if you, that's when people embrace it. It's so, you know, uh, if I could just say what you said, that these subjects are so taboo. Um, you know, I recently, um, we lost a family member and we went to the funeral at a cemetery. It wasn't a Zoom funeral, which there were so many of those, but um, my mom was there and she, uh, she oh, she wasn't there but uh, she was asking about the burial and how, you know, my cousin's mom was put in a coffin. It was a beautiful coffin. And my mother's just spinning about, you know, I don't want that. That's so barbaric to be put in a coffin. I'm, and she's telling my cousin and my cousin was like, why are you telling me that? But in terms of, you know, natural things, and what is the next step? And why is it so hard to talk about it? And my friend Randy, who's my age, his wife, who was our age, had Alzheimer's. And you think that Alzheimer's is something that affects your brain, but you physically can go on. And how confusing it is that Alzheimer's it is de debilitates you you phys physiologically in every way like nobody understands that and and when you talk about brain health what are things that people can do to uh, do something prophylactically that we can prevent this is there a genetic marker that we all have somehow um you know because TJ, your story is so shocking. I mean, your dad was, I'm almost your dad's age when he passed away. And uh, and I'm wondering, how old are you? Jesus, I mean, we're, <laughs> I thought we were the same age. But, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of this because it feels like your brain is one thing. And if you could just eat more, uh, carrots or less gluten like how how can we learn more about it i'm so curious about brain health like you guys were talking about yeah if i can just jump in i think that it's i think so many people are so afraid to even think about their brains and the topic of brain health is so foreign and we've spent so much time focusing on, you know, if your knee is broken, you go to the physical therapist and you're, you know, you want to add muscle, you lift weights. But the brain is such a mystery and that has only led to the stigma that no one is talking about any aspect of it and why it's so important to normalize it. Because once you start accurately portraying what dementia is so people can understand then globally, they'll all say what, what you've just said, which is, what do we do about it? And that's why it's so important to portray it accurately, because otherwise the, the thought is like, oh, well, your memories, whatever. So you just won't remember. And you don't understand, like, as you said, that's an entire 
physiological change. You are no longer the person you were. It is a complete, you know, my mother for the last five or six years of her life was a, a shell of who she was. And to make sure that people understand that that's the reality is so important because it will ignite the energy to then say, okay, well, what can I do? How do I care for my brain? At which is you follow HFC and we'll teach you how to care for your brain. Um, but, you know, that's why it's so important. The work that you guys do is so important. Um, so just wanted to, to say that. I love that. Yes, Lauren. Yes, yes, yes. And it's like, you know, we've had, you know, cancer before us, right? So nobody used to talk about cancer. They'd say, she, she's got the big C. Nobody would speak of it, right? And, yeah. and those stories weren't told. And then something changed. And now we wear loop ribbons. And how can I help? And, you know, if you're bald, that's fine. We don't need to be ashamed of any of that. And there's no more secrecy wrapped around it. And what changed was conversation. We began to talk about it. We told stories about it. We got saw it represented in movies and television and, and, and books. And so this needs to be a similar thing for Alzheimer's, right? Wherever there is secrecy, you're going to have shame. And we're not going to understand it. And so if I don't know what's going on with you, I'm going to get uncomfortable really fast. If I don't have the language, if I don't have, if I have no familiarity with what's going on, I get super uncomfortable and the quickest way for me to relieve my discomfort is to just look away. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I've just turned my back on 50 million people because 50 million people in the world have Alzheimer's. And so Lauren, I love what you're saying too. It's like your brain's part of your body folks. Right. So it's not separate from, so we've been treating it as like, well, we can care about our heart health and our lady parts and our muscles, but nobody talks about how to take care of your brain and we have agency we have influence over the health of our brain so it's like just to get people talking about all of it i love 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 what you're doing so this actually brings me to you lauren because you're here as well so can you talk a little bit about your decision to use your experience with your family to both represent those store that story through film and you know you as you know the fearless leader and founder of HFC. Like, how have you used your life experience to make this change? Yeah. I mean, you know, I feel like some days it's unfortunately I just can't shut up about it, but like, you know, I, you know, spent a lot of time feeling very angry and scared and alone. And as a, a writer, as a storyteller, that's not a space that I could live in forever. You know, and and early on in in my mom's disease, she didn't want us to tell anyone. She herself felt a lot of stigma and wanted to keep it a secret, and that was really hard for me. And so, you know, eventually started talking about it, and you know, because I felt so alone. And then once I started talking about it, other people, you know, came back to say, "I'm dealing with this too. I'm dealing with this too," and it really made me really realize no one is talking about it and no one is sharing it. You know, I in you know the movie that I made that's on Netflix, like Father. I didn't intend that like, when I set out to make to write that movie, there was not a part like, oh, I'll put an Alzheimer's storyline in here. It was, it was a, a natural thing that I found along the way. Of I have a character who needs to have something that really beat him down. <laughs> if you write what you know, <laughs> what I know is that Alzheimer's can really beat someone down, and so that's how it got in there. Um, and you know, it was, you know, actually I have a question that I, I want to ask both Dan and Pamela, but you know, it was interesting in working with Kelsey Grammer in, you know, and, and this was such a small part of the story. There wasn't time. He wasn't on screen caregiving, um, or anything like that. It was, it was backstory. Um, but the conversations we had, you know, his personal experience with dementia that he had brought to the table. Um, and really trying to make sure that like any little detail that we put in felt accurate and real. Um, and, you know, and I feel like we got to that and I'm, and I'm curious, both Dan and Pamela, you know, the conversations you guys have had with your actors, like their comfort level in telling these stories and, you know, how you approach that stuff. Cause it was, you know, it was a delicate thing for us. I mean, yeah, for, for us, I mean, the M Mandy Moore is in age makeup already <laughs> in the job of playing a much, much older woman. And so mm -hmm. um, she's extraordinary. And she does, she came to us at the beginning when this was starting. 
and we put her in touch with people. Different, often different resources than we were using. You know, we'd be, we'd be talking to a lot of um, doctors, a lot of clinic, cl clinicians, a lot of people in the, in the pharmaceutical space because we were exploring it from all angles. And Mandy wanted to talk a lot with people who were in early stages, which is where her character was. Um, and she's still to this day, she's very involved and she does a lot of, oh, she does a tremendous amount of work before that I'm not even aware of before she comes to set because she also has is stepping into the forefront a little bit um, in, in terms of getting word out and being a public spokesperson for, for Alzheimer's. And so she is kind of exceptional doing it all. Um, I don't, and honestly, like we kind of, we go on di divergent tracks with that a lot of the times. Like I'm, I'm focused on the research of writing it and how to write it properly and how to make it feel properly. And Mandy's doing a tremendous amount of work about how she's going to play the character and what, what's going on with her. And it, it's, she just, we just shot a scene with her that, um, I just couldn't believe what she was doing. You know, she's in, in this timeline, she's at very early stages. And it was a moment that I was always fascinated by as I was learning, which is a very, very early stage where you know this thing is coming at you, but you're still you. And what you want to do in terms of your planning and your talks with your children. And we have this and uh, as to what she wants and what she wants from her children moving forward. And um yeah i imagine it would speak to you guys on the right side of my screen tj and lauren like in terms of like look at what you guys are doing right now and in, in our show she was very much very worried about um not wanting to be a burden on her children but at the same time her children are saying to their mother who they love it would be a burden to not be a part of this and then there's the real world logistics that start coming in as it gets worse and so that's all the stuff that mandy is tapping into as an actress um that's what it what is it to be inside of it take you know what is it to be this particular character in this particular moment let alone the fact that she's like 30 years younger than the character and it's all kind of a hot mess but like uh so yeah that I, she does a tremendous amount of work learning and answering your question yeah i bet no and it shows that's for sure I just, you know, in terms of uh, what I've done in the show, and it's not the scope of, you know, Lisa's movie, Still Alice, and what, Dan, you're doing. Um, I, it, the way that I make my show is that I weave certain things in, you know, um, somebody has, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, patches on their, their body or, you know, you see physical things come and go. Um, and that's the way people are. Sometimes you need a little bit of help physically getting through the day. And so the, the stuff that I, I was exploring with Phil is that people make a, a snap judgment about you if you slip or you seem like you're gone, you know, as opposed to the world that TJ and Lauren you guys were living in where you were like you were all in um it's it's and people can judge people so like for example you know my friend that i grew up with whose wife it, it became so debilitating they had to put her in a home he's raising his two young sons and mm -hmm. she was you don't even know the words to to say to be sensitive gone do you don't say gone that's not that's what do you that's rude you know but she was checked out and couldn't live with Randy and his boys anymore and eventually she passed away which again is this question like why does alzheimer's eventually take your life um, and what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And um, why does, you know, I look at my mom who's 86 and why does sometimes, you know, one of my daughters will go, mom, Nana's really losing it. It's that moment, like they've crossed over. And so there's so many questions that people have. And, and that's just the stuff that I folded into the show is just that people check out and they check back in and, and what 
Dan, what you're saying, the, the storyline for, for Mandy, that she's completely cognizant, but it's like a tsunami's coming and she's got the best tsunami warning system, but she can't get out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how frightening that is. And you know, on the other side of it, what one of the things that's been interesting to explore is, you know, we have the bulk of our characters are in the caretaker role, right? They are there's only one character who has the disease and the other five main characters mm -hmm. are trying. And so they're also doing their work. I mean, many of us, myself included, have been touched by losing a parent or taking care of a parent in getting deeper inside of this. I mean, this is a particular beast on the on the family. And and um on a psychological level, on a practical level. And so that's been, I think, in a lot of ways where we're, you know, leaning on the show. It's a show about family and, I mean, what this does to a family and that in talking to families and doing our research is like, it's awful. And at the same time, the families don't stop laughing in other parts of their lives. They don't stop living. Life has to continue. Yeah. Uh, the way you know, uh, we've been part of what's so beautiful about what you guys do is learning more about, you know, the cost of caretaking, the <laughs> what this the burden psychologically it puts on a family that doesn't have the means um, to do the ex to do the extraordinary, which is almost everybody, um, and and so it's complicated. I mean, all, losing a parent is complicated, losing a relative is complicated, caretaking is complicated, but it's definitely extra complicated i think is, is what my perspective has been having not been personally touched um as we've been getting deeper in and also the 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 fear and then the um how people turn it on themselves and they're they're offended you know uh what you guys went through like if you're looking at somebody you know and i i you know i could think about you know still alice or the notebook you know and and just that you're sitting there and some people are just like, okay, mom, you know, and how, you know, where's the line that, it, that it's appropriate that you, you know, everybody's got their own feelings about it. And it, and it feels like it's almost like on purpose or somebody's checking out and that's so heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, I'm just filled with questions. That's, that's all I can give this panel is like the amount of questions that I have. Like, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And what can we do to keep our brains healthy and prevent anything like that from happening? Those are very good questions. And I'm serious, follow HFC because they provide so much education about that. And I'm, I'm into all that too, so we can geek out together. Um, but in terms of caregiving, I, I really applaud all of you because, you know, the situation is it's so it's so rife with conflict. It's it's financial, it's personal, it's emotional, it's spiritual. It's it's there's no one roadmap for how to do this. And you're in the middle of life. You're in the middle of doing all the things. And then, bam, this happens. And how do you handle it? What do you do? Um, it is about it is a very human experience. And there are big big costs to it. Um, everyone goes through the stages of grief, right? So you're grieving the life that you thought you were gonna live is lost. And whether that's for yourself, you've been diagnosed or it's your mom who's been diagnosed, right? Your mom isn't gonna live to be 85 or she's not gonna, like, this is how it's gonna go. Oh, mom's gonna have Alzheimer's. And so the family goes, all of the caregivers are in their own stage of grief. Right? So you might have one in acceptance, another's in denial, another's in anger, another's in bargaining, and you all want what's best for mom, but you're all in a totally different emotional place. And so it's super difficult to arrive at consensus, to know what the right thing to do is. Um, and so I just, I really applaud all of you because it would be easy to wait for when this is cool and sexy and popular to talk about and then jump in and be like, oh, we'll talk about that too. We'll do our own spin. But you guys are at the forefront saying, no, we're gonna talk about this, even if it's not light and breezy and, 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 and easy for folks to watch. I think that people are stronger than we give them credit for. And they're living, millions of people are living this. And I think that feeling alienated and isolated and lonely in it makes it harder. So if they can see your show and know that 
I'm not alone. Look, they're doing it too. Like that has healing that you will never even know the magnitude of. So just as a personal thank you for, for doing that. I'll echo the thank you. Yeah. 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 How are we doing on time? Laura? Well, we have, I would say we have one minute left, Lisa. Do you want to quickly explain the difference between dementia and yes. Alzheimer's? Well, let's It'll take a minute. All right. You ready, Pamela? And, there's, and I get this question everywhere I go. So, <laughs> yeah. so they're often used interchangeably. And I think in part it stems from people are really afraid to say the A word. They don't want to say Alzheimer's. So dementia feels a little softer. So dementia really is an umbrella term. It means that you have an impairment in language, memory, and or cognition. And it's a symptom. It's not a disease. You don't ever get diagnosed with dementia. So dementia is the hallmark symptom of Alzheimer's, just like high blood pressure is a symptom of cardiovascular disease. So dementia is also a symptom of all kinds of other things. So it can be a symptom of a B12 deficiency. Oh, that's my dog. <laughs> that's the alarm going off. It's a symptom of um, sleep, chronic sleep deprivation. It, it's a symptom of Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal lobe dementia, which I know a lot of people have talked about in the comments here today. Um, it's a symptom of uh, Lewy body pics, uh, vascular dementia. So it can be a symptom of depression. Um, so you can have some. The I'm interrupting to say I'm to the main stage. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Oh, this is amazing. Bye. We have to go bye. back thank over. You. It's amazing. Start. Keep, keep talking if you want. But thank you. I love you all. This was so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank bye. you. Bye, Lauren. Thank you, everybody, so much.